Before we begin, I want to take a moment to tell you about our two books on end time prophecy. These are the two signature books of our ministry containing most of the information that you'll find on this YouTube channel, but in a condensed form. And the first one is called Rapture Realities, The Bride's Timely Ascent. And the second is God's Prophetic Agenda, The Appointed Time of Christ's Return. These two books were written in around the period of 2007 to 2010, and they are free on our website in terms of a PDF file. You can download them. You can check out the table of contents. So all of that is on our Kronos Ministries website. Click on the link below if you're interested. And if you would like to make a donation, you're certainly free to do that. I decided it would be proper to make a video for those coming to this channel and wondering who is this guy and why is he teaching on end time prophecy? So I thought I would give some uh, meaning to this, some background and a little bit about my life, how God set this all up, why I am here on this YouTube channel, why I have written the books I have written, uh, what is all behind that? So to do that, I have to kind of get into the call of God on my life. I don't really like talking about myself, but I feel that in this case, it's helpful for you to understand that uh, there was a lot behind this, that God was involved in this. And the only way I know to do that is to tell you what happened. So to begin, I can tell you that I was saved, born again in the 1960s. I was home alone. My parents and my sister were out to some event. And so I was watching a movie called King of Kings starring Jeffrey Hunter. My cousin had given me a white cross and a little gospel track, but I didn't really know much else about the Christian faith. Uh, my parents did start taking us to church when I was in the sixth grade, but we really didn't know anything none of us. I remember sitting in the back row of the church during one of the services at the Methodist Church and asking my mother, point blank, you know, what do you do to get saved? Is it something you say? Is it something you have to believe? Is it something you have to do? And so I'm waiting for the answer and she thought about it for a moment and then she turned to me and said this, I'll never forget it. She said, I don't know. So that's where we were. I can report that eventually my mom and dad and sister, we all were saved and, and gloriously baptized with the Spirit. And so we went on to fulfill uh, our lives. My parents are now in heaven. My sister is still working with us. But the 1960s, as I was watching that movie, I believed everything I saw. I believed what was being portrayed before me. And somehow just watching the movie, I just believed and received Christ in my heart without anyone else there. I remember going to bed. My parents still weren't home, but I went to bed and I had that white cross and I was holding it on my chest and laying there thinking, this is amazing. I feel so clean. I feel brand new. And it was in 1968 that I was at a camp farthest out that was going on during the Jesus movement, the Jesus revolution. And uh, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Fast forward now to the fall of 1970, time to go to college. I had a scholarship to go to Michigan State, but instead I decided to go to an obscure college my parents found out about called Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was part of the charismatic renewal and he raised up college so that kids like me who had no Christian friends could come to college and not be swayed or pulled away from Christianity by some liberal professors. So I went there and this first semester, there was a revival that broke out. It was awesome. 
I've never seen anything like it even since. There were spontaneous prayer meetings and praise meetings breaking out all around campus. Uh, one day, my roommate and I went up to our uh, dorm room and decided to kneel and pray. And the glory of God came into the room, the tangible presence of God. Uh, we were both laying on our backs and God was in the room. So things like that were happening. And in the midst of this revival, a group of us from the dorm decided to go to the library and listen to some Christian teaching tapes, um, which we did. And on the way back, we're just walking and talking and uh, going back to my dorm room. But there's probably about five or six of us. And I'm listening to the conversation, participating a little bit. But inside my mind, in my head, a loop starts playing, which was repeating this, Luke 4.18, Isaiah 61. Luke 4.18, Isaiah 61. Now, this kept repeating and playing over and over in my head. I couldn't get it to not be in my head. I was participating in the conversation to some extent and listening to them, but still in my mind, this would not stop. Now, you have to understand, I was very young in the Lord, so I didn't know anything about these two passages other than Luke was one of the Gospels and Isaiah was in the Old Testament. Other than that, I knew nothing about what these two verses or passages said. Um, and so we got back to the dorm room and I invited them all to come up to where our room was and uh, we all sat around, continued talking, but all the while, Luke 4.18, Isaiah 61 kept playing and replaying in my head. So to finally get this to stop, I decided I'm just gonna look up these two verses of scripture because probably I'll find out that Luke chapter four doesn't even have 18 verses in it, or if it does, it will be something that doesn't mean anything and then I'll be done with it. So I looked up Luke 4.18 and read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, I was kind of blown away by that. I thought, well, that is definitely something that means something. Is this God calling me into the ministry? Is this for me? And so I decided, well, let me see what Isaiah says. Isaiah 61 is what kept repeating in my head. Luke 4, 18, Isaiah 61. Not a specific verse, so I figured, well, it must be the whole chapter. So I turned to Isaiah 61 and began to read verse 1, and I read this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God. And then it goes on. I recognize God's calling me into some kind of a ministry. And he's doing it in a supernatural way because there's no way in the world in a million years I would have known that Luke 4.18 and Isaiah 61 were the same passage for the simple reason Jesus was quoting from it when he stood up in the synagogue, when he entered into his ministry. In other words, I could not deny that God was calling me supernaturally into the ministry. This call was confirmed in a supernatural way when I went home at the Christmas break. It was confirmed by a vision that I received, which also in a very bizarre way included my mother. The circumstances were like this. It was one evening and I was retiring to bed. Now my parents' bedroom was next to mine and then down the hall my sister's but I'd closed the door and I decided I would kneel down at the foot of my bed before I went to sleep. 
When I knelt down, I just began to pray. The spirit of intercession came over me, and I began to grieve for the world. I felt their hopelessness. I felt their despair. It was as if Jesus was next to me, and we were both grieving over the world and desiring them to be saved. And as I was kneeling, suddenly I saw floating in midair above my bed an aluminum garden pail. It was not unlike the one we had in our basement, but this garden pail looked like someone had used it for gardening and didn't bother to wash it out when they were done. So it was in kind of a filthy state. It had some film and like caked on dirt and so forth. But suddenly this crystal clear water started pouring out from heaven into the pail. As it did and the pail began to fill, of course the water, I could tell, was kind of muddy, was kind of filthy, dingy. And it was spilling out of the pail and I remembered thinking, if you want to take living water and give it to people to drink, I wouldn't want to drink from that water. But in the vision, the water kept pouring. And it poured and poured until the overspill eventually flushed out all of the filth and debris until the pail looked like it was brand new shining like you would see it in the hardware store if you were buying it off the shelf. But yet the water kept spilling out. And so I thought to myself, now that's water that would bring refreshment to a thirsty soul. But as the vision came to an end, this scripture verse came to my mind and I was familiar with it. It was 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 20 and 21, which says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now, just to be clear, we know that we are cleansed once and for all by the blood of the Lamb. But there's also a verse in Ephesians that says that he sanctifies and cleanses her, his bride, his church, with the washing of water by the word. So I interpreted this vision as being that, that we are to be filled not just with his spirit, but his word. And together these things make us a vessel unto honor that's fit to be used by the master. In any event, as the vision ended, I went to sleep, and the next day, our family was riding down the expressway, going to my grandparents' house. Uh, my dad was driving, my mom was in the front seat, my sister and I were in the back, and uh, I was behind the driver's seat. So as we were going down the road, eventually my mom just suddenly turned around in the seat and looked at me and inquisitively said, so what were you doing with the pail last night? And that shocked me because I had not told a soul about the vision the night before. And so I tentatively said, what do you mean? Because I'm wondering, what do you know that I don't know? And so she said, well, I heard you go down into the basement last night and get the pail. And it was clanging all the way up the stairs and you were clanging it down through the hallway and brought it into your bedroom. And I turned to your father who was still asleep in bed and I said, what's Jeff doing with the pail? And he said, I don't know, maybe his stomach's upset. And so he wants to set it next to his bed in case he can't make it to the bathroom in time. And so I then relayed what had happened and we realized that God had worked something supernatural here. I saw the pail in a vision. I never left in my bedroom, but somehow, that I still don't understand today, my mother heard me 
go down into the basement and get the pail and bring it up to the bedroom. Now that's quite of an unusual uh, supernatural event to me, but it really ministered to me because I realized that this was God confirming the call in my life that I had received earlier that fall at ORU, that he was calling me to be a vessel unto honor, to be fit and available for his use. Now, at that point, I still didn't really know what the call entailed, what he was calling me to, but that would be confirmed again in a supernatural way many years later.